from this document called the Apostolic Canons. And it was believed by the people at the time that this was very ancient. It, it dates to about the year 300. And there were 85 of these, but only 50 of these were known in the West. So at least 35 of them were unknown in the West. And so when they came over, it looked like something very unrecognizable. Now, there were the difficulty of this canon, of, of this council, was uh, there were one issue was they restated the condemnation of Pope Honorius for that letter. So that's something that's going to keep coming back and being a, an issue. Besides that, they introduce a number of can disciplinary canons that effectively are large criticisms of what of liturgical and canonical practices in the West, uh, such as celebrating Mass on weekdays during Lent. This is not something the East does or did, because the understanding was, well, the Divine Liturgy, the Mass, is the most joyous point of a Christian's life, that, that weekly celebration of the liturgy. If we are to be in a state of penance in Lent, we should not be engaging in all that joy. We should not have the Divine Liturgy during the week. Which in sin, and so it is a period of great penance because that is the greatest good in our daily life. So that, okay. So that is a practice in the East, but that was never, in the, in the West, uh, daily Mass had long become a custom. So, the condemnation of this practice. Uh, another matter was fasting on Saturdays during Lent. Now, currently under disciplinary law, as we remember from our first lecture, is, not, is something that can change with time, right? Our Lord says, and the days are coming when you will fast, but the how and in what sense, uh, that may change from time to time. And, uh, the precision of the customs may also alter with um, the changing of time. At this time in Rome, in um, the Latin church, there was the custom of fa fasting on Saturdays, not just on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, but the Saturdays during Lent. Um, really, the, there were more than just the Saturdays. But in the East, there was never the practice of fasting on Saturdays. So they... The, this council looked at what the customs were in Constantinople and said that these are should be the customs for the entire church. So some of these start to get uh, controversial. In the West, we do not sing the Alleluia during Lent, right? This is a practice that goes back way before the 600s here, but the East they did. So this is another thing they can do. Um, using unleavened bread for the Eucharist. In the East, they use leavened bread. And it's a condemnation of a practice that in the West goes back as far as our records go, right? Um, and there was also the recognition in the East, they, at this council, they recognized the right of deacons and priests to continue to live with their wives after ordination and prescribing excommunication for anyone who tries to separate a cleric from his wife. In the West, the... Uh, the West practiced the ordination of married men, but the understanding that after ordination, they were married to the bride of Christ or the church, so to speak. In the East, that was kept long with the, for the bishop, but in the West at this period, and um, that there was, if a, if a man was married when he was ordained, the understanding was that he would separate from his wife. Now, you can see that this is not always easy to do, right? And um, this is one of the reasons that over time the practice of ordaining, um, ordaining married men and having this was scrapped, right? But at this time it was still part of the discipline. So the disciplines can change, they're there for a reason, but um, it's not a, a divine law. This was, uh, so the, the council was, the findings of the Quintessext council were received in the, uh, in the East, but in the West they were not received. And this came as a, uh, a shock, and um, Justinian II took it as a personal insult that the Pope had rejected these. And so he was going to do with, um, 
he was going to do with Pope Sergius what his predecessor, Justinian I, had done to Vigilius, kidnapping him and imprison him until he agrees with him. Um, however, there was uh, the local militias in Italy kept the Pope safe at this time, not like they had it in the uh, previous period. And uh, a nice little palace coup d'etat throws uh, Justinian II out of power. He has his nose cut off, but uh, it took <laughs> some, of the, some of the things that happened in the palace in Constantinople are uh, a bit curious centuries later. He eventually gets reinstated as the emperor, and it is at this time that he reconciles with the uh, pope who now has the name Constantine, Pope Constantine, different pope, he didn't change his name. Um, and it was agreed that, well, the West will not observe these, the East will, and we'll just leave it at that. So um, there were no doctrinal issues, these are disciplinary issues. Uh, for the most part, except for that thing going back to Pope Honorius, but even that is not a matter of divine revelation, except perhaps indirectly. Uh, now, this in, so this is about the year 710, right? It seems like everything's fine, re, re, reunited again. Um, the two churches, East and West, are at peace. And then... Um, there is a new emperor in the year 717, and a new problem arises. This is Leo III. And Leo III um, forced the resignation of his predecessor, another uh, palace coup. And he was soon faced by the second siege of Constantinople. The Muslim forces surround, and he, he is a successful military officer. And this is one of the things that plagues, another factor that plagues the um, Eastern Empire. The most successful emperors, the ones who are militarily successful, are the ones that have the most theological problems. And yet they, they see the importance of the church in the empire as a source of unity. And they understand that they have this role in the church as a divine role of sorts. Uh, ends up forcing the heresies down the throats of the people and down the throats of the local church. So this is a, a problem that reappears again and again. And at this period, um, Emperor Leo III decrees that uh, against... He becomes very leery of the use of sacred images. So this is the beginning of the iconoclast controversy. Uh, iconoclasm, the smashing of icons or images. He, um, one of the things, there is a, a number of theories, how did this come about? Because it existed prior to his, I mean, it was a well-established custom in East and West, the use of uh, sacred images, right? It didn't just appear on the scene in the year 700. It was well-established before then. Why did he Decide, why did, how did he get this idea that there was something wrong with, the, with images depicting our Lord, depicting um, the Mother of God, depicting the angels or the saints, or images from the Gospels? Why did he come up with this? Some people think that, well, it was because of all of the military success of Islam. So at this point, nearly 70, 80 years of unbroken military success by Islam, they're up into southern France by this point. And he sees this, well, maybe this, some have speculated that he sees all this success and he concludes that that's because God is punishing uh, Christianity for its uh, venerating images, uh, um, acting in violation of um, making graven images, right? And seeing, but there's not, a, there's not, there's insufficient proof on that front. Others have pointed to the fact that that he changes his mind on this issue um, very shortly after forcing all the Jews in the empire to be baptized. And, well, the Jews held this, uh, held this um, belief against, you know, making uh, graven images. So maybe it comes from there. Again, inconclusive proof. A third theory is that he grew up in an area of Syria that was very heavily...